truly involved in the entire process. It was really, uh, and all my children were involved. So uh, Arlen was very good at you know listening to things that we said. Because lots of times people hear something and they pass it on without even checking whether it's true or not. And there's been so many things said about my husband that uh, were really character assassination. And this is a chance, I think, to bring the truth um, that he was assassinated. And we always knew that. We've always, the family has always fought for justice. And um, it was only last year that we got that justice. It's not complete. We're still working with the government uh, on some of those things, but I think we're on the right path uh, for that to happen. And as you saw, my children are now grown. I have grandchildren, and they know about their granddad, you know, and feel a sense of loss. My 10-year-old grandson, who was supposed to travel with me, said, I can read about him, but I don't know him. Why don't I know my granddad? All my friends have granddads. And so it's a struggle. The struggle continues. I think we've won part of that struggle. And, and this movie is part of it. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the presence in this auditorium of Shaka Rodney. Uh, before, before I call on the, um, uh, the two filmmakers to say something, may I ask Lavinia, Stella, to talk about your involvement with Walter Rodney's How Europe Undeveloped Africa, and your involvement in this film. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Dina. Thank you so much, Dr. Rodney. Um, and also Anne, who helped this connection to happen in the first place. Um, so my name's Lavinia. I started this journey at SOAS, and quite ironically, as some of you may know here, SOAS is the hub of colonial training, was the hub of colonial training, kind of still is to some extent. Um, and it was there that I first had my, because I studied African studies and development. Um, I had a lecturer called Kwaja, who's now gone back to Ghana. He gave us, on our reading list, Walter Rodney's book. And he was like, this is something that you need, um, not only in this kind of classroom, but also just going forward to think about. Um, so I took it very, very real. Um, and I remember embarking on that journey to then go to my development studies class to actually say that this book needs to be on the development side of things because if we're learning about the development of the world in Africa, why is this book not on the reading list? So that led me into a lot of activism with um, a society that I co-led called Art, Art on African Mind at SOAS. Um, and it also kind of led me on to um, going into different walks. So um, Tony Warner's walks, Black History Walks, it just really helped me to think about the contribution of not only Africa to Europe, but also our thinking, um, and to also see that at SOAS, where Walter Rodney studied, his book wasn't really utilized and even kind of taken seriously was so frustrating, because um, it's alumni, but it's also a work that, like, why shouldn't we be celebrating this? So um, I kind of felt that, yeah, I, I needed to do something about that, and there was a wider, um, a mission in the curriculum of not only Walter Rodney's work, but also information about Africa and the Caribbean and thinkers from the Caribbean and Africa that were, and also written, um, that would be profound for young people to learn without spending 9K a year. So that's why I set up the back curriculum to really get information to young people at an earlier level um, so that they could read the imbalance. and have information that could empower them, but then also critically allow them to see the world differently. Because um, many of you here, including myself, never grew up learning Black British history, um, and Black British history is global history. 
So yeah, that's what led me to the film. And again, thank you so much, Arlen and uh, David, for everything. Um, it was a really moving documentary, and I'm just really excited that this is in public view. Irony, the longest speakers are available uh, in the program, and you, if you don't already have one, uh, you, can, you can take one as you, as you leave. Can I ask now Gina Miller to say some few words? Yes, um, it was, I think, about time this documentary was made. So thank you both for, for the amount of work, and I know it wasn't an easy task. But there's one thing I wanted to say to you, Patricia, which is people don't know that because my father spent a lot of time trying to get the certificate changed because it meant that he and the family didn't get money. Right. Because for so many years, it was seen as a criminal offense. So he was never, it never said his death on the, the death certificate as being assassinated. Mm -hmm. So you, you talked in the film about bringing your children up as a single mother. People don't realize that you were actually denied finances and the money you should have rightly had from his death too. Mm -hmm. So I want to say for my, on behalf of my father, that he's so proud that he was able to work to look up for you. But the, the things I remember about my father and, and water, I mean, it's funny when you said in the film about everybody going in and out of the house. I remember my mother cooking and in and out of the house all the time. You know my mother. And uh, I was this little girl lying at the top of the stairs trying to figure out what these important, what these men were saying, what was important. <laughs> but my father used to tell me that um, the reason why it was so dangerous in WPA was because it was about bringing the two races, black and brown, together. And that was seen as dangerous by the colonials, uh, by Britain and America, on top of the fact that they were also seen as being communists. But that goes back to when slavery was, was, when slavery was abolished and indentured labor was bought, which is basically second class slavery, secondary slavery. A lot of the divisions we have around the world between brown and black come from that time. Because that's what the colonial masters did. They knew that if the two races came together, it would threaten their power. So the stories of, and the myths about lazy black men, Indian people who work all the time, all those, all those myths started then. Mm -hmm. And that is what the rise of Guyana, and that's why Guyana, the racism there has been so different, because it's a place that Burnham actually was able to use that to stay into power. And even now, it is still there. And it is one of the most disgraceful forms, all forms of racism as evil. But to bring two races who have been mistreated for hundreds of years to fight and hate each other is true evil. several decades ago, but he wasn't on the curriculum. And what he showed me was quite simply that the history that we were taught in school was not complete. And that history is of real importance because it actually shows that we, that all of us, white, black, brown, uh, our history needs to be told because if it isn't told, nothing changes. <clears throat> um, and that's why I'm really, really pleased that I was finally able to make a film that I hope kind of conveys some of that, and particularly, as it were, from a historian, an activist, and you don't normally think of those two words together, but they are, they should be permanently joined. Um, and I hope it tells, it shows something that you might spread and that we will continue to spread messages like that. But 
Thank you. Thank you. not so much about the bad reviews, but about the fact that there was a secret department um, established with the Foreign Office, a court co-operated with the security services to put out um, information secretly within newspapers and influence the debate a form of soft power, which has been extraordinarily successful. I'm pleased to say that in Walter Rogers case, they fared dismally. <laughs> Great, thanks very much, Harlan. Um, okay, so just put your hands up and, and address anybody. <laughs> Is there a microphone? Okay. Shout again. Somebody in the front. I'd just like to say, magnificent, thank you. It um, won't be long. Just to say, I studied English with African Caribbean studies many moons ago at the University of Kent, and we brought in Walter Rodney's book ourselves. There were many books that weren't on our curriculum, um, on our book list, I should say, and now we brought Walter Rodney's book in, CLR James, and a lot of other books that we, um, we did ourselves, and I'd just like to say that this struggle has been going on for a long time to put books in to, um, into our uh, children's libraries, our working libraries. This is where, those who know me, I mean, you might know me, Sandra Agard. I mean, I worked at, thank you. No, 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 no. Just, to say, just to say, we worked at um, um, Southwark, and Peck, um, Southwark and Lucian Libraries, Islington Libraries, and we've, this, we've, we've been doing this behind the scenes, since pricing, when it was in Hackney, Book Place, Head Start, New Leaky Books, Vogue Over True. We've been doing this for a long, long, long time. And just to say, Walter Rodney has always, and will always be, one of my, and a lot of other people's all-time hero. And thank you, um, Dr. Rodney Cook, for doing this, because you could have just gone into a corner and just not done this. But you have been, Mega Taliban and give thanks a shame. So hey. 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 And I'd just like to say again, fantastic film, thank you. And Dr. Uh, Pat Rodney, it's just a part of being in your presence. Thank you for being here, for making this journey to be here with us. You just see the love in the room that it's so important and the legacy is so important. But I know a lot of other very quick question. Um, there was a, a quote from Walter Rodney that's right near the end, and I didn't know which, and I'd just like to know which, um, when he made the that speech, where it came from, to create a unity based on struggle. I think that is just so important. I'd just like to know where that came from. Um, and I just want to let people know about this other project, The World Reimagined, which is trying to um, instigate this work about how our children, everybody needs to know African history from before slavery. And the first poem in the book, I don't want to pick up myself, I'm picking up water. <laughs> the first poem in the, book, in, in the book that's coming out is a book on how you were underdeveloped Africa. Because I thought it was real important that our children, 10 years old upwards, need to know that there is an African history book by an African that they need to know about and need to read. Thank you. Just, just so you know, that was um, from The Sky's Wild Noise, uh, which you can actually find uh, on YouTube if you'd like to. 
in the sky's wild noise. Uh, I probably would like to say something about <laughs> Walter Rodney's books for children. Yeah. Um, Walter wrote two children's books about Guyana, which was supposed to be five, and the sixth one will be a separate book about the indigenous people who were there. They never arrived in the Guyana, they were always there. He was able to complete Kofi Badu, which was at the printers when he was assassinated. It's Kofi Badu out of Africa. And he's telling the story of Kofi, this young, well, when Kofi got to Guyana, he was already 40 years old, an enslaved person. But he told the story about Kofi living in Ghana and his life before he was captured. He did the same thing for Lakshmi, who was a young Indian girl, who was an indentured slave left in India to come to Demerara. They both ended up in Demerara. And he did these books specifically. Well, they started out as stories he would tell our children. And then when we got to Ghana, it was supposed to be a radio series where the stories would be read. And the government said, no, we don't want Walter Rodney's voice on the radio. And so somebody else would read the stories. But when they discovered what the stories were about, it's just history, they banned the stories. Um, so Kofi Badu and then Lakshmi was published posthumously. We are in the process of republishing those books because we think they're very important. Also, the, the uh, government as Guyana has asked us to republish the books so that it could be used in the schools. And Walter had dedicated the book to his three children, Shaka, Kanini, and Asha, and the children of Guyana, because he felt if we didn't know our history, we didn't know where we were going, we wouldn't understand each other. That's a lot of the problems in Guyana. We don't understand each other. We don't respect each other's culture. And what he was attempting to do is educate people, and especially young people, about our history and how we arrived in Guyana. And we are all connected in some way. So we, um, before I left home, we were just working, because we wanted to make the books more attractive for a children audience. And it took us much longer than we thought it would, because we had to source all these new uh, photographs. We also had to increase the, um, the font size. And we are working with a school, a freedom school, two freedom schools out of Detroit. And they found the books um, useful because the book could be used for any group of people. It's not just confined to Guyana. That's the unfortunate people think this book is just for Guyana. It's not. It's about building the respect and the love among people and especially children. So hopefully, by November, those books should be out. And if you go to our website, you'll be able to see how you can purchase them. Um, Walter Rodney Foundation. Okay. Should I go? <laughs> I think we've had one person over here who's been having their hand up for a long time. Uh, well, I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you so very much for a wonderful, well-enjoyed uh, film. Um, my question is that uh, given the fact that most um, African countries today um, don't really teach history, at least uh, slavery history, or in fact, even um, the um, history of Africa's underdevelopment by Europe mm -hmm. is not very much taught, I believe that your film is a wonderful medium for sort of, uh, you know, sort of propagating that story and that experience that Africa has been through. Um, now, because history is not taught in the schools, but Africa has a very thriving and developing film industry, is there any prospect or any plan afoot to make this film available on the continent? Yeah, there is. Yes, where um, I've been in touch with um, a couple of distribution um, agencies, I guess is the almost the word. Um, uh, and we're hoping to distribute it in Southern Africa and in East Africa. Um, 
at starting there and then seeing how much further we can go. Nigeria? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think anyone who can help Ireland and has got any contacts, that's probably... Yeah, exactly. All right, Leland, after this. Thanks, thanks a lot. I, I think it was a brilliant oh. film. Well done. Oh. Well, he's, he's a long yeah. <coughs> uh, my question is about your filming in Guyana. I think it was brilliant you spoke to Donald and then where they spoke to Arthur. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. But, um, oh, yeah, it's better. Yeah, it's about the uh, filming in Guyana. Now, it's, it's good that you spoke to ordinary people and you spoke to those, um, those two brothers. But it's curious you didn't speak to anyone from the WPA. Now, Rodney he went back to Guyana and he formed the WPA. I don't know if it was very important that it was on the verge of overthrowing Warren and was trying to kill him. But uh, just a, I'm just curious why he didn't speak to anyone from WP. I mean, I think the problem always with films is you can only talk to so many people, and partly because of all of the continents that Rodney was important in, we had to make sure that we talked to people that could reflect on his life in all of these places. If we had a longer film to work with, definitely would have been an avenue we would have gone down and definitely something we would have liked to have looked at. But we had to be quite selective because we already, we actually, this film was going to be a 30 or 40 minute film. Um, and somehow it grew. It grew, it doubled in size. Uh, and with the resources that we had, there was only so much that was possible. But a very good point and something that we were thinking about as well, actually. Greetings, family. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm also a student at SOAS um, right now, and the situation is still the same in terms of Walter Rodney's legacy being completely yeah, not, taught, not taught about and not seriously dealt with. And actually last week we reclaimed territory at SOAS as the Walter Rodney Freedom Square. Um, so we engaged in intercultural, intercommunity and intergenerational dialogue about, um, with communities of resistance across the world to talk about our global liberation struggle and our essentially our struggle for global justice um, as part of a process called the Planet Repairs Action Learning Education Revolution, um, which is very much done, yeah, with Walter Rodney's legacy in mind always. Um, and I think one thing I wanted to bring to this as well is that Rodney says that our study of history must always be in service of a revolutionary objective. So not just, um, yeah, not for history's sake, but to understand how we can transform our social reality, how we can encourage everyone to engage in that. And that revolutionary struggle being the struggle for global African liberation and the struggle for global justice. And we talked about how, he talks about how the phenomenon of neo-colonialism cries up for extensive investigation. Right. And neo-colonialism is what we live with right now. So that's not a case of, so very much the decolonization work, the decolonization struggle is an unfinished project, which we all need to be thinking about how we participate in this. And we talked about, and in the film it was mentioned, his Pan-African Revolutionary Organizing. So I guess my question is as well, what Pan-African Revolutionary Organizing are we currently engaging in to bring about a change in our social reality, to bring about true decolonization and the end of neocolonialism? And I think one of the key um, movements that is currently looking at this is the movement for Pan-African Reparations, um, which brought forward the, the Planet Repairs Action Learning Education Revolution and the Reclamation of Water Rodney Square. And I think your continued resistance against SOAS through celebrating the work of Walter Wadi and his legacy is so, so important. To answer your question, I think the, the best thing that you can continue to do is mobilising. Um, Safar isn't here, she was featured in the film as well. But Safar's, um, she won the Walter Wadi Prize for her dissertation um, called Can We Hear the Past? Which kind of reflected on Sudanese revolutionary movements. And I think just speaking through your work, utilising the sources that we have, um, and also connecting to students who are also outside of the university helps to ground your work in the economic reality that we're facing as well. Because um, reparations is the goal. I think that is really what we all want to see here. Um, so the more real that you can make that through your work, through mobilizing, through building on those conversations and also producing work in SOAS is gonna further extend the power. So continue doing what you're doing and you know, more power to you.
Overnight, because at that time, Black Londoners was the program. And by seeing the film now, it frightened me to the fact that I'm just beginning to understand what I have to do. But even more than that is the fact that I followed so closely the politics and history of Guyana. Because David, you always said to me, can I have the interviews that you did with um, Mr. Jagan? Person who would never have been interviewed by the British if I did not meet him in Trinidad during the time there was a big conference. And I remember him walking down the hill and he said to me, Alex, man, you must interview me. <laughs> and then he came to Britain again and I interviewed him. I understand, Mrs. Rodney, what you have been going through. And somehow or the other, I hope that I can find a moment sometime to just chat with you. Because Walter, I met once in person. But having dealt with the Caribbean on the media here in Britain, and having gone down to the Caribbean and dealt with the type of governments that exist in the Caribbean even to today, I understand, Jenny Miller, the beauty of what you were talking about. So young people here who don't understand the British media, the education system. This is a fantastic film to say to them, if you don't see something like that, there is nobody to educate you on the media. A black person talking is not what it's about. A black face is not what it's about. It's about standing up and being able to deliver. That is what it's about. So I'm delighted to be here with my wife. I have an interview, I have an interview I've done with Dr. Rodney. And although people may not realize it, I'll be glad to hand it over to you for something like this, because it deserves to be heard. Thank you very much.